There are millions of acres of opportunity out there. They belong to you. Every day, decisions are being made that affect your land, your water, your wildlife. You should know about them. This is your mountain. Welcome, everybody, to the Your Mountain Podcast. I'm your host, David Wilms. With me, as always, my co-host from, I guess, today about, oh, 500 miles away, 400 miles away, Mike McGrady. Hey, Dave. How are things in Lander, Wyoming? Lander's awesome right now. I can tell you that. I, as soon as we're done, I'm going fishing. Um, I am jealous. I am extraordinarily jealous. Uh, so I hope nothing but the worst for you this evening. I uh, hope your waders <laughs> fill with water and you lose a bunch of flies. Nephi I'll Cole, that on my own. <laughs> still here, Dave. Still here. Yep. Um, yeah. I, I, so Nephi always says he's still here. It's surprising. We're all surprised. I'm surprised. Dave's surprised. Yeah. No, we're all surprised. Um, one of these days, it's a treat for everybody one of these. One of these days, you're going to call and I'm not going to answer. One of these days, I'm not. I'm, I might not still be here. That's probably true, and then we'll all be happier for it. Thanks, Dave. You bet. Appreciate you know I, my efforts. Appreciate it. I know. You know I love you. Um, well, I'm gonna. I just want to watch you set all this garbage up yourself. I don't know if I could do it. This thing that this thing would end. That's right. That's how come we're here, Mike. <laughs> That's right. Dave has no technological capacity. Period. Can barely work my phone, but you know that's yep. That's why I love you guys. Um, so we are today. We are in Eagle, Idaho, uh, right outside of Boise. For those that aren't familiar with Idaho, um, and we are sitting in a- actually absolutely beautiful conference room. Uh, with I'm looking out over a nice lake with a fountain, uh, and it's it's making me want to work here. So we are <laughs> <laughs> we we are joined by Kelly Thornton from Cryptech. Um, thanks for being here. Thank you guys for having me. Thank you for coming. And Kelly, I I had to write this down because your list of accomplishments is just uh, it's not it's nothing that anybody can memorize. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two hundred or the twenty fifteen Artemis Award for the Outstanding Woman Conservationist of the Year. Correct. The 2016 recipient of the Guide Outfitter of British Columbia's Outstanding Woman of the Year. Yes. You've been a past board member of the Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance. Correct. You're a lifetime member of Safari Club International, the Wild Sheep Foundation, the Professional Hunters Association of South Africa, and Wyoming and Montana's Wild Sheep Foundations. And am I missing? What am I missing? It's you are. If there is something in in conservation or in the in the sportsman's world, sportsman's community, you're in it. I've just I've totally immersed myself into this industry for a long time. So I feel very blessed and very fortunate to be able to have had those opportunities. What made you decide to immerse yourself in this industry? You know, I've just always had a passion for the outdoors ever since I was a little girl. Uh, wasn't really given the opportunity until later on later in life. Uh, to be able to explore those feelings and passions. And so it just blossomed from there. Describe, tell, later in life, I mean, you look like you're about 29. So when you say, when you say getting... I know I liked you. Yeah. <laughs> when you say getting involved later in life, I, you know, so it, it wasn't something that you started as a kid. No, actually, I was about 12 years old. We had a hunting lease. I'm from the South. If you guys haven't already figured that one out. Um, and my uh, family had a hunting lease. It was a deer lease down in Alabama. And we would go there on the weekends during hunting season. And so on one particular occasion, I was there. And uh, I don't know what it was. I woke up one morning with just this you know, sense of urgency to get out and go with my dad. And I had a brother at the time who was uh, four years younger than myself. And so my dad, I said, hey, I'm ready to go. And he said, I'm sorry. He said, you need to stay back here, do the hair, the makeup thing with your aunts, and uh, I'm going to take your brother instead. The funny part in all of that is my brother today is not the hunter I am. And really? Yeah. And so I stayed back, and um, 
it wasn't until, you know, I was an adult and I had met this guy and he provided me with an opportunity and uh, I took it from there. And so that kind of then spiraled the next 20 years. So That's, uh, I mean, it, it's fantastic that you're involved. It, it's also, it's too bad you couldn't get involved as a kid. I mean, that's, yeah. that's got to be kind of tough. I mean, so, so Mike and I both have young daughters. So I have a, well, Mike, your daughters are what, 10 and seven? Yeah. 10 and 10 and seven. Yep. Uh, and Going into perfect, fifth grade and, and second grade. Perfect ages to, to be exposed to that. And I've got Absolutely. a nine, almost 10 year old and a six year old. So, um, and they're, you know, these kids are our friends and it turns out so Mike's and my wives took our, each of our oldest daughters through hunter safety about oh, fun. what, like two months ago. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and my kids have been going along on hunts since. Well, I have a I have a picture of a at a Drew Moose tag. I have a five years ago or so, and I have a picture of myself. I, I was I'm using air quotes. I was bow hunting uh, mm-hmm. with with my daughters. So I had one in the backpack and one walking with me. Oh, that's cool. And uh, we're wa- working up a draw, and we see some deer, uh, or I see, I spot some deer uh, on a on a hillside. My wife's there too. Spot some deer on a hillside. And I stop and I bring my youngest, my oldest daughter to me, who at the time was about four. Mm-hmm. I say, honey, honey, look, you see, look on the hillside. There's some, you see the deer? And she just, in her loudest voice, daddy, we're not hunting for deer. We're hunting for moose. <laughs> just keep, <laughs> keeps on going. Uh, That's awesome so, though. Yeah. So it's, uh, so we, we try and get our kids out. Um, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm sorry that you didn't have an opportunity to go as a kid, but I'm glad yeah. that you have an opportunity to go now. And from what it looks like, you are taking advantage of those opportunities. Absolutely. You know, I think you, you know, when you first start into the hunting, you're all about just going after as many species and, and animals as possible. And then I think you, you evolve over time. And I'm sort of now at the point where, I mean, there's still species and still animals that I want to hunt, but I want to give back. And so I'm at that stage where I want to make a difference for someone else that maybe may not have the opportunity if they didn't have that in their life. So if I can expose someone to it, it's all the better. So how do you go about doing that? I mean, I, I think you're, what you're describing is a you know, mentorship. Right? Exactly. So, so what do you do from a, you know, how do you mentor uh, new hunters? I think, well, you know, you involve yourself, involve yourself with some of the associations and organizations that are out there that have membership opportunities. You can volunteer. Um, education is key, you know, just being able to communicate why it is that we love to hunt and fish and all those things. Um, and I think, you know, being, being a role model, you know, and showing the women that, gosh, you know, she can do that. I guess I could too. Uh, Young girls, you know, who are coming up, who are watching their dads or their moms go out into the field or maybe not. And just being able to kind of open their eyes to something they would, they've never seen before is pretty neat. We used to be very active with the youth. Um, It was a youth outdoor event that Dallas Safari Club, and they still do that today. And that was something I was extremely involved with. We would take a a bunch of group of kids out for a two-day course where they learned all sorts of things from archery to muzzleloader to pistol. Um, So they learned all of these different skills and things in the outdoors. Um, They also learned about um, ethics, you know, being in the field and, and you know, always making sure that your muzzle is pointed in a safe direction, you know, those types of things. And so I think um, being someone that can can do that and can facilitate those opportunities, you really are making a difference. Have you have you seen the results of those efforts? Are you are you seeing I mean, I think I'm, I'm assuming one of the reasons you want to do it is we need to recruit more people into hunting and angling. Absolutely. I can speak to, especially in Wyoming, you know, when I moved to Wyoming 10 years ago, 11 years ago, um, I moved to Park County in Cody. And it was very interesting. When I moved to Cody, we were told that only, you know, we were so close, I think about 45 minutes from the east gate of Yellowstone, but we were told that about 40% of 
the kids that are in Park County actually get to Yellowstone. And I thought, gosh, what a tragedy. So um, my husband and I at the time got involved and got very active with this outdoor recreation group that started in Park County. And we went in front of the school board and really pushed passing the ability to do, it was almost like a, um, oh gosh, just like a uh, field trip, if you will. Yep. But it still had that educational com- you know, component to it. So they had to journal and things like that on the yep. bus and everything. So anyway, long story short, we went through and got that passed. And so Park County, then every fifth grader at the start of the school year was bused to Yellowstone for a full day of activity. And uh, I'm so proud that you know, we were able to make that happen. And I think of how many, you know, lives we've impacted over that time. And it's still going on today. That's really cool. You know, we were involved, uh, you know, about a, well, it's been almost two years ago now. I had the opportunity to work with a group that, uh, that, uh, put together a field trip where we brought a whole bunch of families from all over the Western U S we picked mm-hmm. one family from each state and brought those families to Yellowstone for a week. And uh, they all had to have a fourth grader because at the time, you know, there's this every kid in a park pass. Yeah. And so the idea was that the families were supposed to bring their kids. Uh, and, and we picked families that had um, either, you know, either some of them were, they were from all over the place. But in general, they had some some unique identifying factor. Some of them had never been camping before. Uh, we had wow. one of them was a super family with, you know, like three Eagle Scouts, you know, so you had this <laughs> kind of wide variety of, of, of different kids there. But we, we brought them to Grand Teton National Park and the, uh, the, uh, I can't, it's, uh, are you thinking the, the location, like where you had it? Was it at the Jackson Lake Lodge? It was. We, it was oh, nice. actually above, it was above the Jackson nice. Lake Lodge. We had some of our meetings there. We had a, you know, uh, but we, we all stayed in the, we stayed, we had them staying in these, uh, they call them a tent cabin. Um, out at the out at the lake, yeah. And so those tent cabins are kind of halfway a cabin, kind of halfway a wall tent. And so again, for these folks that you know had never you know done anything like that, Coleman was one of the sponsors and donated sleeping bags and oh, wow. and, and lanterns, and they were just absolutely phenomenal. But these but these families all came together, and the 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 most interesting thing that they said when they you know after being there for a while. We had a special dinner. We brought a Commander Rourke Denver came out and, and spoke to all the families. But these uh, these families, you know, said when uh, when the activities stopped for a little while and you had all these kids, they all went out and they were all hanging out together. All these families and, and they, each family had a fourth grader, yeah. so that kind of tied all these different families together age wise. But it didn't matter where those kids were from. It didn't matter, you know, whether they were, whether they were from St. Louis. Or whether they were from some tiny town in Idaho, um, they were friends. After you know four days, they were all best friends, and it was it was super cool to see them enjoying the great outdoors. We called it the Great Outdoors Western yeah. Camp Out, um, and it was super cool to see that 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 they were that the outdoors unified them, and they all commented on it. The families were like, you know, they're crying, they're hugging when they had to leave each other. It was just a really really cool experience. That's something really unique and special about our industry. You know, it has a way of doing that. You can bring people from completely different walks of life and just the hunting experience or the camping experience brings them together. And to your very specific example of busing kids to, you know, getting kids to Yellowstone, I can speak from personal experience about how, how impactful that is because when I was in about, I can't, I, I can't remember if it was fourth, fifth, sixth grade, but in that range, um, and I lived down in southeastern Wyoming. We had a program just like that. And I don't think they do it anymore. But we had a, in that part of the state. We had a program just like that where I was bused to Yellowstone. I spent a week in, in the Hayden Valley uh, living in cabins. And it it was – we journaled. We, oh, wow. we learned about the park. And it, was, and it was right after the fires, you know, the fires in 88. Dave, I think it's really cool that you had that experience um, in southern Wyoming, you know, similar to the one I was talking about in Park County. Yeah, I just, it, it's just, uh, I'm so glad you're doing something like that or, or that you, you did something like that. And it's really neat to hear that that's still going on because I think it's in, it's not just impactful for them at that time. I mean, I, I'm looking back 
almost 30 years and I still remember the hikes we took and my PE teacher given me, you know, he's the only one that brought a fishing pole and he, he broke sticks off of trees and tied some of his line to it so we could just fish (laughs) with sticks, you know, and it was those kinds of experiences that, um, that you remember that you you absolutely remember. So thank you for doing that. Oh, absolutely. I think it speaks volumes to where this industry has evolved over time. And I think people are really looking at things far differently than what they used to. So uh, we just jumped right in and I didn't get a chance to really talk about what it is you do. I mean, we know the things that you, the, 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 the things that you do, we, we know the awards you're receiving, the, the, your, how active you are as a, as a hunter and an angler and in that community. But professionally, what, do you, what is it you do? So I, I have known the two founders of Cryptic, uh, Butch uh, Whiting and Josh Cleghorn, for, since they started, actually. So long time. Um, amazing, amazing guys. And in fact, I actually, when I first met them, we talked about a woman's line. Uh, I was really pushing for um, that to happen because there was just a void in the market. Really, no one at the time was doing any of that. And, you know, I just, it was just something I couldn't really get immersed with at that time that we initially had those conversations. So then years later, um, a logo change and uh, a life change. Uh, Here I am in Eagle and I am super excited to be working with, with these guys, or I should say, yeah, working with them, working alongside them. Um, Butch always corrects me on that. (laughs) And, um, but working for a brand that I really feel very passionate about Um, the military, I'm extremely passionate. My family was retired air force. So that's very near and dear to my heart. And, um, yeah, it's exciting. I am the, uh, director of public relations and brand marketing for the organization. And, uh, I'm just really blessed to be able to, uh, promote what these guys are all about. So you've kind of followed this through, I mean, this speaks a lot about your, you know, your, your passion for the outdoors, but also about, um, you know, bringing more women into the sport because you've done this for multiple companies now. I mean, you, this is something you have followed through, as you said, through several brands. And so not only have you helped, you know, solidify, uh, with one of your current competitors, you know, kind of a female brand, but you've also, now you're, now you're carrying this forward with another company. Absolutely. You know, that women are with the fastest emerging market and, uh, it's something that women are getting more and more involved with. We, um, we as an industry are showcasing the women to be very relatable. And I think that's really important. Um, the general public can relate to these gals that we put up there in the limelight, you know, and I, I say limelight, but we view them as, you know, influencers, um, the voice of, of women in the industry. So you guys work with Jana Waller, correct? Absolutely. Jana is one of our, um, one of our ladies here, our women influencers. Uh, she actually runs our cryptic legion, which is a ladies only legion group of incredible industry influencers. We had a chance to talk with her uh, very recently. And, uh, you know, we, after that, you know, Dave and I were talking as we were driving, uh, uh, up here where we, we mentioned, you know, what a great voice. I mean, what a great advocate. You know, you see you know, there are a lot of different stereotypes of people that are associated with the great outdoors, and she so does not fit any of them. She's articulate. She's intelligent. She's, I mean, she's just. She's, she's just authentic. A, yeah, she's, very, all, she's awesome. Very. Yeah, yeah she's, she's awesome. A, she's yeah. a great representative. And I, I think I actually, I mean, I, she's a she's a great representative of the community, but she's also a, 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 a great mentor or, or somebody to look up to for young women getting into the, the great outdoors. Absolutely. Young men too. But uh, but my my daughter's comment when we were talking to her was uh, when, when we were talking about her, her TV show, she said, I'm so glad that there are girls that get to have TV shows too, and it's not just the boys. <laughs> so it, it makes a difference. It, it really does. does. Well, we're, we're making a name for ourselves. You know, and that's something that I can tell you from being in this industry for as long as I have, you know, there's, there was a period where I had to prove myself. So I have to, so I got to ask you a question. There's a, and this is a, this is sort of a policy type of question, but it's also, I mean, it's related to 
women in hunting. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been noticing – we saw it happen in Wyoming. I've been noticing a movement in other states. I think Wisconsin was one. Um, I'm trying to think of a couple of others and, and just drawing a blank right now. But state legislators, legislatures passing bills um, to allow to, uh, pink camouflage mm-hmm. uh, in addition to uh, orange. Curious if you have any thoughts on that movement. Um, I have some personal thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I am not, I'm not a gal that wears the pink uh, in the field. It's just not me. Um, I don't see it, though, as an insult. I see it more that I think the states that have passed that have done it mere, basically just to be an advertisement, you know, for trying to get more women involved. Um, I don't really see that as anything that people are implementing in the field. I have not seen it at all. Yeah, um, that was going to be my question is, are you, since these laws have been passed, is, is there demand? Do you, do you think there's a demand? Do you think it's actually leading to more women in the field? I don't. I really don't. I think that what it's doing, it's it's certainly being discussed. So it's it's definitely being heard. But I will tell you, and I've talked with folks. Um, I've talked, in fact, I talked with a, a very good friend of mine um, in Wisconsin um, the other day on this issue, and I asked, you know, what what are your thoughts on this? And the feedback I got was, look, it this is, it was merely just a campaign to raise awareness. Um, He's got two daughters. Those daughters do not wear the pink in the field. Um, You know, so I don't, it doesn't insult me. It's just, um, I personally just don't see where it plays an impact. So can I tell you the part that kind of bothered me? And mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I'm not not allowed to be bothered (laughs) as a a man. (laughs) I, I frankly, my philosophy is I don't care what people wear as long as I can see them and they can see me. Uh, but in addition to the awareness argument, one of the arguments I've seen used in a, in multiple states to pass this mm-hmm. uh, has been that pink is more visible than orange, uh, and and that there's a textilist from the University of Wisconsin that's been able to to show that that pink is more visible than orange in uh, in, in certain environments. And so my my thought. And the reason why it bothers me a little bit is I, I'm kind of curious how many people we've had, you know, how many, how many accidents we've had with people involved, you know, that are, that are wearing orange and would have pink, would pink have prevented that accident. Interesting. Uh, and if that's truly the reason, if that's the best color, then we should all be wearing it. Yeah. I think what you're saying is <laughs> if that's true and pink's better, then we should all just roll with pink. That's exactly right. If it's not, right. then it's, you know. I have no well, problem with the raising awareness and, and I'm going to defer to it. Um, to the community that it's meant to uh, influence, right? Which I, right. I think has been to try and get more women involved. And, and mm. so I'm going to defer most of my, uh, you know, I'm going to take whatever their opinions are. But just on a basic, uh, from that, the safety standpoint, yeah. my my safety argument is, if it's really safer, maybe we should all be wearing pink. Well, and I, I will piggyback on that. I feel like, too, that if if that was the case, we would have done this a long time ago. Yeah. Right. And I think it is more or less a misinformed decision um, that has been made because I really do not believe maybe that was the only way they thought they could get it, you know, passed. Yeah. You, you had to find some other excuse for it. Exactly. Yeah. Because Which, we would have done this a long time ago. Yeah. So do you, as a company, do you make any, uh, any, fluorescent pink um we do not pink it or shrink it <laughs> <laughs> well uh dave uh you see if it were up to david we'd all be wearing like uh kind of old weird <laughs> yellow colors and things like that because you know um in fact you know I, I will tell a story about dave real quick dave um you you were fluorescent orange hunting correct i do is it fair to call it fluorescent anymore uh, so I've described it as it's like a worn traffic cone. Yeah, worn traffic. <laughs> there you go. How old, it's uh, traffic orange? Yeah, Dave. We 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 have a, a back and forth about uh, gear because this guy wears. He has a. I think when he uh, when he was born, underneath the Christmas tree, his dad left a orange vest, 
And uh, Dave has taken it upon himself to wear that vest for the rest of his life <laughs> till he passes away and give that vest to his children. So I, that's a, only a slight exaggeration. <laughs> <laughs> only uh, slight. You've written articles about that vest. Oh, yeah. He's, oh, wow. He's very proud that his vest um, He knows predates. that vest. I did. I wrote an article for Bugle Magazine about that vest. And it was um, so that uh, my dad gave me a vest and it, he probably bought it at Walmart. Uh, I don't even know. I couldn't even tell you the brand when I was fourteen. Walmart just, didn't exist when you maybe so, <laughs> may, yeah, may have been yeah may have been something else. But anyway, he he bought me this uh, this vest when I was old enough to start big game hunting, and he bought himself one too. Mm-hmm. And so we had matching orange vests. And uh, I at the time I swam in it because I was just this <laughs> tiny skinny little kid. Uh, and now I can't zip it. <laughs> <laughs> Partially because the zipper's broken, but but I still wear that uh, every year. Look, it was something from your dad. That's exactly right. Does your dad still wear his? Probably not. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, he might. He might actually still wear it. But I have a lot of pictures of he and I on hunts where we're both wearing that vest uh, with an animal. And and so that's, I just think it's kind of cool. I've had that vest now for almost 20. For all the game wardens listening that require people to wear fluorescent orange. I want you to check Dave's vest. It's it still <laughs> qualifies. It's still plenty bright. Oh yeah, sure it does. And I can wear okay. other gear underneath it. It's that's you know everybody has those tokens, right? Oh, you do. I was just thinking, my stepmother, um, she knitted a scarf for me, and I will tell you, my very first mule deer was taken in Wyoming. It was a two o five mule deer. Oh, wow. Uh, I was about forty minutes outside of Cody. And uh, last day of the season on a over-the-counter tag, do-it-yourself kind of deal. Um, but I wore that. I wore that on that hunt, and I've worn it since then on, See, on all those hunts I for that I reason. I liked you <laughs> <laughs> for a reason. See, you know, we all have, we all have mementos. Totems. We you all have, have, have those things that you yeah, carry. I've got. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, just, uh, yeah, I mean. Tell us yours. Yeah. You know, I don't know that mine uh, is hunting, but I, there's this uh, – I really enjoy shooting sports. And uh, there's this event that I like to do. It's called the Sniper Adventure Challenge. And I think it's absolutely one of the coolest events that you can do. And it's a, it's a multi-day, you know, 50-mile orienteering slash, you know, uh, team shooting competition. And, and a, a good buddy of mine who is a – who Sounds you guys amazing. know very well um, went with me on this. But anyway, I've got this cowboy hat that I wore – on the, the first time I competed in the event, just like, like a cowboy hat. And everybody joked with me like crazy when I showed up with this hat. But it was awesome because it's very practical. It keeps the sun off. And so – and and about, you know, very few people who – about less than 20% of people who compete in this event finish it. Well, everybody joked with me going across the finish line. It's the, <laughs> the only cowboy hat to ever finish the Sniper Adventure Challenge. So now every – like That's that thing cool. goes to every shooting competition, that hat. And it has the, the uh, a Velcro patch on it that you get when you finish this event. It says finisher on it oh, on the back neat. of that hat. So the so the only cowboy hat to ever finish the Sniper Adventure Challenge accompanies me many places. And what place did you finish in this, Mike? Sni- fifth, fifth place. You know, fifth, fifth place. Yeah. So fifth place is only the fourth loser. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. That's, uh, I appreciate that. Those As somebody that could never accomplish uh, finishing the Sniper Adventure Challenge, I'm you're totally entitled to make fun of you. For <laughs> yes, you can. And do. <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, that's funny. <laughs> Mike, do you have one? No. I just <laughs> wear whatever I got. <laughs> you just go with whatever you've got? Yeah. you got to have something. Yeah. Nothing? No. No, I don't. Well, we'll get you. So <laughs> yeah, we'll have to start f- one. Dave yeah. and I are going to find you one at the airport on our way home. <laughs> uh, there we go. Yeah. It'd make yeah. it worth it for me. Yeah. No, we need to get you one. I think we can find something around here in this office that we might be able to send back. <laughs> All right. I'll wear that. Happy <laughs> That'll be my children. <laughs> certainly be pleased. Uh, yeah. So, so like, oh, Kelly, ahead, I was Mike. wondering, I mean, you, you talked about having to prove yourself at the beginning, mm-hmm. you know, as, as getting those, those barriers to entry and, and really having to go above and beyond and proving yourself. I mean, can you touch on that a little bit more? And and do you think that going, if, if a woman was to enter the sport and was to adopt that blaze pink sort of, is that going to be an impediment or, or a problem for assimilating into the, the hunting culture today? You know, um, I will tell you personally, I feel like it, it might um, definitely um, 
people might not take her very seriously. She may have to work a little harder to get beyond that. Um, just because that's just not something that I think industry wide, I mean, we all may say we don't have a problem with it or whatever, but I think as a woman, um, most of the organizations, you don't necessarily see a ladies membership. Mm -hmm. Some have it very few. Um, I personally don't want to be put into a separate bucket from everyone else, from all the other hunters. I'm a hunter just like you guys are. I don't want. No, you're special- better than we are. <laughs> no. well, yeah. I don't know that. No. We, we've seen the stats. They're yeah. Pretty, yeah. yeah. But I would say that you know I want to be considered like like you all, and so I think it has a negative connotation to it. Um, you do have to prove yourself. I, I just it's gotten a lot better than what it was. But look, this was traditionally a man's world. And it wasn't until the last probably 10 years that really women got more and more involved. And now, probably within the last five years, it's significant. I mean, it truly is significant. So what, uh, you know, Dave talked about our daughters getting into hunting, or at least we're Mm -hmm. hoping they will. I mean, what advice do you have for the young lady that's looking to get in to help them sort of break through those barriers? You know, there are some great um, organizations that are doing some amazing things. There's Beco- Becoming an Outdoors Woman um, program that most of the states have. Um, yeah, by the way, uh, Mike and my wives applied for that in Wyoming this year and did not get accepted into are the program. Are you serious? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, people. there's so much it's demand for yeah. it. Yeah, there's so it much is. demand for it. It is. They put yeah. in with, uh, what, five or uh, maybe four or five of their friends. Of, it was a group, yeah, yeah. group application, and they did not. Oh, my goodness. They were not goodness. accepted. So, I mean, that's both that's There's good a and bad. It's a double-edged sword. It, yeah. It's yeah. such a popular program with women yeah. uh, that it's actually becoming difficult to get into it. That's interesting. Well, see, there's an opportunity yeah. right there, you yeah. know, for someone else to, to create some sort of similar program. There's a program that Brittany Boddington, um, the daughter of Craig Boddington, she's a, she's a good friend of mine, and um, she goes down to Texas um, at the 777 Ranch. And mm-hmm. a couple of times a year, she puts on this outdoor skills camp, and it is absolutely fabulous. Um, Cryptic has been a sponsor. Leupold has been a sponsor. Um, several other brands have, too. It's fabulous. And um, they they basically go through a period of about three or four days of just education, training. And then what they do, which is really fun, is then they apply what they've learned into the field. So the girls are actually getting to hunt, too. So it's a fabulous program. And uh, if anybody listening wants to get involved, um, you can certainly go and visit um, out the She Hunts Outdoor Skills Camp. And uh, it's a great program. You know, one of the unique things I think about your company is I think that your company kind of uh, has has crossed over and broken the mold a little bit of what you'd consider maybe your traditional hunting demographic. And, you know, you talked about outreach to women, but I would also think one thing that your company does extremely well, and and maybe you could touch on this, is uh, veterans. So, you know, we're, we're looking at the need to grow participation in hunting and the shooting sports. What's your views on, uh, you know, t- can you talk about your work with veterans and then kind of your thoughts about growth of the hunting and shooting sports with that group? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so from both a local level and a national level, um, Cryptic has been very involved with a lot of programs that are trying to take the vets and they're trying to either provide them with opportunities. Maybe there's some PTSD and things like that that they're dealing with and just giving them a chance to, to go into the outdoors, kind of escape all of that that they're dealing with and provide them with this incredible opportunity. So there's There's organizations like that that we're involved with. There's also organizations that are trying to get the veterans back into the workforce, and we participate with them, too. So looking at it from a lot of different um, avenues, but just being a a support system to them and knowing that, hey, Cryptic's here. Um, You know, we were built on uh, the battlefield. And we're now, we go from the battlefield to backcountry. That's our, our tagline. I know you guys have heard that. Uh, there's, there, it's real. And um, the vets are very, very important to us. And we have a very deep appreciation and uh, 
that's obviously firsthand for a lot of these folks that are involved with cryptics, though. You know, one of the things that I that anybody can know if they go back and look at the numbers is, you know, influx of hunters and kind of when people have come in, when you have overseas conflicts and you have these groups who are going out and, uh, you know, basically spending all this time out in the great outdoors um, in these, in these uh, you know, familial, you know, f- you know, relationships, you know, whatever you want to call them, you know, with their, you know, these group relationships, these group dynamics, they come back and they have a unique skill set in that, you know, they know how to hike. And they, you know, they're not scared of work and they know how to get by in the great outdoors. They are, they are, are, are proficient and familiar with firearms. And, uh, you know, and you can see those numbers coming back from World War I, World War II, uh, the Vietnam area, like mm-hmm. upticks, significant upticks in the people who get out there, um, you know, hunting because it just, it, you know, because it's, it's it's normalized and it's something that makes them you know it's a, it's a it's a very positive thing. Uh, it's familiar. I, it's familiar, yeah. And I, and I think, yeah. boy, we really are. We can't lose that opportunity now. Um, I mean, we have so many vets coming back now. Uh, not only is this a great opportunity to do something good for that community who have served us, exactly. You know, but um, when you talk about you know, selfishly, the future of, of hunting and the North American model of conservation, we're really missing an opportunity if we don't, you know, if we don't reach out to those guys and say, hey, guys, come on, let's let's go hunt because this is this is something you should be part of. Exactly. It's it's a way to it's a way to say thank you, because guess what? If it wasn't for those guys, none of us would be able to be out in the outdoors experiencing the things that we get to do. So we're all very, very fortunate, very blessed. And, uh, you know, there's an organization, Wounded Warrior Outdoors. Uh, Ron Rabode is uh, the CEO of that organization. And I uh, I have volunteered on a, a trip to Alaska with some guys that have come back with PTSD. And I'm telling you, it is it is a life changing experience for not, for not just the volunteers, but for those vets and to see them come together where they can just, you know, everything that they're dealing with, they can leave at the door. They come out there. There's no one putting pressure on them. They don't, you know, they just get to be themselves. And it is such a powerful experience. I I really encourage if people have not ever gotten involved with that to really do that because it's, uh, it's really powerful and they very much appreciate it. It is. Um, Nephi and I have both been involved in an organization in Wyoming, a local organization mm-hmm. that, that helps take uh, disabled veterans out uh, for uh, primarily pronghorn uh, hunts. Oh, but yeah. uh, we did one last fall that uh, it was pretty impactful for, I think, everybody involved, um, you know, the the veterans and, and the volunteers alike. I mean, it was, yeah. it was definitely impactful. And, you know, I got to be there and watch somebody take their first ever antelope. I mean, oh, that's amazing. And it was, yeah, it was I, phenomenal. I think it's the, the, the equalizer. You know, we talked about the kids in Yellowstone. We talked about all these other things. The great outdoors are such a huge equalizer. And, and when you're hunting, you realize this. That's why everybody, if you're listening to this, you know, if you haven't hunted before, you need to. Uh, if you have a friend that hasn't, you need to take them because you realize that and when you, you even s- need, you even need to take them to your spots. Yes. You yeah. to, don't, <laughs> yes. don't, don't yeah. be that's, selfish. Well, don't that's, be selfish. that's one of the, I actually yeah. think that's one of the, the hard parts for people that get involved in hunting they uh, when they're go. adults. Yeah. They don't know where to go. Yeah, and then they have them. friends that maybe, maybe they're like not as Dave. good of friends as they think they like are this because guy, they don't want to get Dave share to spots. give a hunting spot out would be. You like you couldn't torture him enough to get him to give it away. He would absolutely <laughs> never ever tell you. It could be the worst hunting spot on earth. Dave's not sharing that. I, every place I hunt is terrible. That's why I don't share. <laughs> That's right. But yeah, going I, back, I mean, the the thing with with uh, with being up there in the mountains is it literally everything disappears when you're up there and you are you know you're you're looking for game animals. You're dealing with the weather. You you really reconnect with mm. something very elemental within yourself and it allows you to let everything else go. You learn a lot about yourself. Yeah. So it's what awesome. What's been your your most favorite backcountry or your hunting experience? 
my hunting experience, it's, so it's very interesting. So I, my, the favorite game I have is African game. I love it. Any particular one? Um, I love it all. You just like being in Africa? <laughs> I do. I do. I feel the most alive. What is it about it? I don't know. It's just something in me. I feel like I've, I don't, I feel like I've always been there. And I mean, you know, my friends laugh at me because I've been there 15, 16 times, 15 times. And I get emotional every time on that plane when the pilot, you know, normally the pilot will comment or the stewardesses will comment that, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we are crossing over on African soil or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. They tell it much more glamorous than I do, but it is, it's a powerful thing. And I, you know, I'll look out the window and I will start to cry every single time. But I think when you stop crying, you shouldn't do it. Um, (laughs) That's just my philosophy. Why is that? Because it's just, you know, it's just so special to you. And it just, it's so, it has such a deep and profound meaning to me. And um, I, I just love it. But I, but the funny part is the most memorable hunting experience I've had has been my trip to Kodiak Island. And I will never trade it for anything in the world. That was by far my finest hunting experience to Which, this day. So just, just so, hang on, just so we're clear, I mean, for, I'm sure most people know, but Kodiak Island is in Alaska. Correct. Yeah. Correct. It's in Alaska. And I, I drew this tag uh, for Mountain Goat, which was a very coveted tag. And um, this was my second year putting in. So I felt pretty lucky about you drew that. drew a Mountain Goat tag on your second year? Yeah, I was pretty excited. Hmm. In fact, I was very excited. <laughs> <laughs> you should be. Huh. <laughs> yeah, it was, well, congratulations. Thank you. Belated. Thank you. It was, yeah. it was awesome. And it that trip, well, first of all, Kodiak Island, if, if anyone has not um, has not been there, it is a very surreal place. It's just majestic is the only way I know how to describe the mountains. They're just beautiful. It's very lush, very green, um, just stunning. And this mountain goat I had really trained for. Um, I had worked very hard and the year prior, I'd, I'd hunted uh, stone sheep in British Columbia. So I was training literally a thousand feet every day. I'm climbing, you know, just trying to get myself acclimated to what I was going to be dealing with. And Kodiak is, is, um, it's difficult. It, you know, my guide, um, told me that grown men have cried on, you know, on this hunt. Um, There's a lot of elevation gains and losses. So you've got to be able to deal with that both physically and mentally, probably more so mentally than anything. And um, yeah, I had a pack, you know, I'm not very big, but I had a pack that was probably going into that about 40 pounds, I guess, maybe. So with, for my body weight, Mm -hmm. that's a lot. And, you know, we hiked seven miles in and, um, it was, I learned a lot about me and I learned a lot about the fact that if I just kept my mind, you know, clear, I could do it. And I just needed to focus. And I did, um, I was able to get extremely close, which is what I wanted to do. That's very important to me. I, sure. I can take those shots at five, 600 yards easily. But to me, I wanted to be up close. I wanted to live amongst the sheep, the sheep, the goat, whatever the case is that I'm hunting. And so anyway, I was able to get within 40 yards from that mountain goat. Um, you know, and you learn to trust your guide. Um, but you learn to trust yourself more importantly. And I took the shot. It was a successful shot. My, my goat ended up, you know, I didn't know at the time, but my goat ended up being a Boone and Crockett goat. And uh, it's now going to be at the awards, the next uh, Triennial Awards, which I'm super excited about. Uh, I'm more excited for the goat and for my guide um, (laughs) because I'm not a I'm not a gal that's, you know, so focused on all the awards and stuff. But I I really appreciate that. You know, that was a gift. Totally. But I think that trip, I learned a lot about who I was. And that was the most important thing I could have ever walked away with from. I think that is an awesome story. And I think it's, it's what's really cool. 
everybody can have that story. And I think too many of us don't take that opportunity. Well, not everybody can, everybody can have that not story. Not that story. <laughs> but a story. just do it on the second try. <laughs> <laughs> but By the way, I have to digress for a second, and then you can, you can have your moment. Um, <laughs> I have a theory, a conspiracy theory. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to talk about getting more women involved in hunting? I think, and I don't know if this is true or not, this is my conspiracy, tin hat theory. Okay. Right? Please take this with a grain of salt, everyone. If, if you want to, <laughs> if you, you want to draw a difficult to draw a tag, mm-hmm. um, there are two things you need to do. Okay. One, be a woman applying for it, or two, be on the party application with the woman as the lead on the party <laughs> application because I secretly think that the departments out there this from are the, trying to get more women involved. This by, from the guy who drew a moose <laughs> tag with like a less than a like with like a point oh two percent chance of ever getting it on his first try. It wasn't my first try. It What's was your my, excuse? It was Dave? my sixth try. Um, well, now I've been but, putting in for bighorn sheep in Wyoming, and I don't know what's happening here, but <laughs> I'm not being very successful. All right, so you you're can't putting trust, my... You can't trust Dave's theories. Dave's... I, I'm, <laughs> he's been watching the Zapruder film I'm a just, lot. I really want this theory to pan out because my daughters are going to be of hunting age soon, and I want to put them as the lead <laughs> on, on, my appli- on my party application. There well, you go. <laughs> well, you need to start... They need to start getting on... Getting points. They can't. They're not quite old enough yet. Okay. Because, uh, you know... And, uh, what is the age? So, in Wyoming for big game, it's twelve. Okay, and I think here is it ten in Idaho. I think it. Uh, I, I think it's, it's younger. 10, I think it's yeah. ten. It is younger. Yeah. I said it's ten. Now. And yeah. when, when I was a kid, it was fourteen in Wyoming, and and you know that's an interesting discussion too because we're we're lowering these age limits to get kids out there. But I can tell you when I was fourteen, I mean I told you at the beginning I was this yeah. small scrawny kid. I mean I was I was four foot eleven and like a like a buck five maybe less than that i couldn't handle a big rifle at 14 i -hmm. shot my first elk with a 243 and that recoil hurt and so that's impressive yeah and so uh well i shot it a lot of times he's a little guy too (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so but but you know i just i I total digress but you know i it's an in, that'd be an interesting discussion to have at some point is yeah you know, what's too young for kids to be i mean we want to get kids out in, into the field but what's too young to have them you know hunting big game i mean they clearly aren't going to be packing it out or maybe they're not going to be packing much out right uh, and right. can they handle i mean maybe it's when you're big enough to, up handle to the, the parent firearm. i mean the yeah it's up to the parent that, and, that knows the kid the best and they're going to be doing a lot of the work anyways a yeah. lot of the work <laughs> <laughs> maybe no. most of it no yeah. So anyway, that sorry that was my that was my <laughs> tin hat theory. Nephi, you want to go back Thanks, to your, your deep <laughs> your deep discussion now that I have no uh, we don't want really... to uplift anyone after we <laughs> no, you digress need, down the no you need to bring it back up canals to some, of your brain you need to bring it back to something respectable <laughs> you know, here. Well, the, hey, it's just do something hard. Yeah, and, and that's what I want yeah. to say. You know, when people you know we I did a Ragnar a couple of weeks ago, and, and it's and honestly, when just do something that is perceived it's hard you know because when you do that when you commit yourself to doing that you learn about yourself and there are all the different levels of that you can find something else hard to do next year that is as hard or harder than what you did before but when you do hard things um, you find out that you're you introduce yourself to capabilities you didn't know you have and uh and it's good for people man it's good for the it's good for it's good for the soul you know it's good for people i had a question for you um you know because we you talked a little bit about hunting in Africa, mm-hmm. how would you contrast? So you've hunted in Africa, you've hunted in the U.S. How, how would you contrast the two? So if you were going to tell somebody, hey, this is the big difference between, you know, hunting in Africa and hunting in the U.S. And do you perceive, you know, with the different the the different models of wildlife management that exist, you know, what's your can you tell the difference and, and what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, very interesting. So most North American hunts, you're hunting for a particular species. And in Africa, it's so diverse. There's like 27 plus, you know, different species that you can possibly hunt. So that's that's one thing that's really unique and different. And that's both on uh, plains game and also dangerous game. Um, you know, hunts in North America are often done horseback or backpack, stands, vehicle, that kind of thing. And then in Africa, you know, they utilize a safari vehicle. They call a bucky. Um, you know, that's that's one way. Um, and once you get to a location, then you're, you know your stock will begin. But 
anyway, that's for the most part. And then you've got um, the game animals here in North America. Um, for the most part, they're a public resource that's managed um, by states or provinces or, or whatever. Well, in Africa, I mean, all of that's privately owned. Mm -hmm. So that is something that's quite different. And then in North America, um, well, let me backtrack. So then in South Af Africa, um, you know, they have experienced a similar rebound in wildlife, um, you know, that North America has um, back as early as the 1900s to what they have records today. Um, but North America uh, is definitely on the public trust doctrine um, for the North American wildlife conservation model. And then South Africa is still on a privatized model. So you've got other areas like Zimbabwe, Zambia, Mozambique, Tanzania, and those are all managed on privately leased government owned concessions. Have you, so, have you hunted in multiple countries there? I have. Can you tell the difference country to country? Do you, is there a different feel as you go between country to country? Yeah. Uh, you know, when I, when I hunted in Zimbabwe, Mugabe was in, it was very, very different. Um, very different. Um, you know, they still have land claims, and those land claims are quite serious. Um, you know, those people are not even given a notice. And, you know, Mugabe's folks would come in, and they can basically tell you, you have to leave. Pick up and leave. I had neighbors that were, at one point, that were uh, that were told to leave. Yeah. yeah. it's it's a, It was a serious thing. Happy to to see that he is now out of power, but that country still has a long ways to go. I will tell you, um, South Africa is quite different, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, so if you're going to recommend a country that, you know, I would say that, I mean, they're all wonderful. Mm -hmm. They're all wonderful in their own right with what they have to offer. They all offer something very different, very unique. Um, Namibia, Namibia is kind of, she's almost the best kept secret over there. You know, she's beautiful. She's got just extremely diverse uh, topography. She's got an abundance of wildlife uh, that can be hunted. You don't have a lot of the issues and things that a lot of the other countries are dealing with. So, Some of the challenges that exist yeah, in other places. Yeah, so, and it's it's very clean. You're very safe. Um you know, and I think that's that's what's so sad is some people have this idea that, you know, Africa is not safe. And I think that that is too bad. You know, there yes, there's certain parts of it. Look, but there's certain parts of it here in the U.S. I mean, no matter where you go, you're going to deal with some of these issues. I think you just need to be open. Be open and experience it. Africa is something that I guarantee you every single person that goes to that con to, to that continent, they don't leave without rebooking. Mm -hmm. They really don't. They're ready to go back, and they don't want to leave. So here's here's the other thing. I I'm curious about Africa as well. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you deal with? I mean, let's just be honest. The the press when talking about hunting in Africa mm -hmm. doesn't put it in the most favorable light. They never do. Never do. Right. Mm -mm. How do you respond to that type of? Um, Controversy? Oh, yeah, controversy, criticism. I, I, don't, I don't, I mean, it, it's a, a lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's just, you know, how, how do you address those okay. that, that would question why somebody would go hunt in Africa? And I, I, I think, uh, and I'm not, I, this isn't my answer, I, but I, I think people, their ex most people's exposure to African game, African mm -hmm. wildlife, is when they went with their family to the zoo. Yeah. And they see these animals in the zoo. And then they see stories on um, on mainstream media about, you know, ivory trade and poaching. And, you know, they, it, it, and they see all these negative connotations of of taking wildlife and they don't hear any of the positive stories no, or the impacts don't. that, that hunters have uh, when they travel to Africa to hunt. And so I'm, I'm curious how you respond to the, that, that type of criticism from it's folks. It's very interesting. And sadly, we as an industry have done a very bad job. We've all talked about it for years. All of us. I mean, no matter whether you're SCI, no matter whether you're Dallas, no matter whether you're a, a clothing brand, we've all done a very poor job. I think we need to be, we also have a responsibility. If we're going to call ourselves a hunter, we have a responsibility to communicate what that means, what that is, 
and why we do what we do. We also need to be very mindful of what it is that we're putting out there on social media. If you're going to put yourself out there laying or straddling an animal, that's not going to send the message that we want to send. What that does is that just gives fuel to the fire and that allows for the media to do all of their misreporting. It allows for all of the PETA people to come up and start their protest. I mean, it just sends us and our industry down the spiraling black hole. And so we need to do, and I'm extremely passionate on this, Mm -hmm. but we need to do a far better job communicating that message. We, We need to talk about how no animal is wasted. In Africa, when you shoot that animal, that animal feeds a village. That's significant. You know, why are we not telling that story? Why are we so focused on putting these what I call trophy shots out there that are not the best, you know, in the best light. You know, it's one thing to stand next to your animal, but be mindful. You know, straddling an animal is not the way to show yourself. You You can do that. What's the alternative? What's the alternative photo look like then? An alternative photo would be, okay, why not showing photos of everyone sitting around the campfire, enjoying the harvest, you know, that's powerful. Or, you know, showing kids and families in these villages that are so, you know, desperate for food and, and showing them sitting around a table eating and enjoying the benefits that this hunter has just, you know, provided. Those are the things that we need to start showing. So I've yeah. heard responses to, so I, I, mean, I mean, obviously, yeah, I agree with you. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I've heard responses to that of, well, it feeds a village, right? Uh, and the response mm-hmm. I hear sometimes is, well, why can't anybody from the village go out and hunt and feed the village? Why does it have to be uh, somebody, from, somebody America. from America coming over uh, to feed that village? And that's interesting. They do. They do hunt. They do, they do that. Um, it's just a, a matter of, you know, what's available. You know, do they have the resources to be able to go out and do those things? There's a financial component too, right? I mean, right. to these to these places, you know, when you yeah, look at it's not the North American model. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, like you were mentioning, Kelly, yeah. it's not the North American model. And it's, in some right. cases, you you, you got to pay to play, and it costs a lot of money to pay yeah. to play there. Yes. But when you had, you know, there's some examples, and they're real examples where you had communities where when you saw an elephant before, an elephant was like a death sentence to a family because if you got an animal that can come in. And you have been spending your entire life trying to take care of a small crop so that you can feed your kids. And you've got uh, a population of animals that will come through and destroy that. Those animals are not your friends. Well, when you can, when you can, when when you can utilize that resource to, instead of having it be nothing but a hardship on your family, utilize it as a way to bring in an additional economic incentive that can allow you to let your kids grow up and go to school. That's a that's a that's a that's a, a, a one hundred and eighty degree it's a difference. Game changer. Yeah, and other things that I think are lost sometimes on the general public here. We have, and I'll get, I'll forget the acronym now that I, mm-hmm. now that I'm going to say it. But we have species that are listed as un, as CITES, Correct. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and there are some species that are so you can be listed as a as a CITES species. You can be listed as a threatened or endangered species. You don't necessarily have to be on both lists, but there is a provision in the U.S. right mm-hmm. in the U.S. law mm-hmm. uh, that allows the importation of some of these animal parts, so long as you can show that you're actually having a conservation benefit on the species in that country. So that mm-hmm. you know, so one of the reasons for hunting in Africa in some places is because it actually creates a conservation benefit, and it's a lot like what we how we talk about it in the United States that hunting can be conservation. Right. You know, it's and great segue, Dave, to talk about, you know, one of the other things we wanted to chat with you about, you know, we so the North American model is different, mm-hmm. but there are folks who uh, even within the North American model, you know, there are premium tags. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, what's the value, you know, and you have worked with a lot of organizations that benefit from these. And so whether it's a governor's tag or commissioner's tag. Can we, you know, talk a little bit about those and kind of sure. and, and, and kind of the controversy? Yeah, sure. when we say premium tag, I think what Nephi is talking about are these tags that are are set aside by states um, that 
can be given to, you know, in some states it might be given to a nonprofit organization to then turn around and try and raise money Absolutely. for conservation, right? And that's um, and that's kind of the model. I think most states do it that way. They don't they don't all have to do it that way, but but that's what we're talking about. These these tags that are set aside that end up generating. You know, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, and you know, there's some there's some criticism of that because you know is it potentially taking away opportunity from others where we have the North American model was it was supposed to be an entry point for everybody, right? Right, and right. and by having the more tags you have put into this system where it's where you're having to pay high dollars for them, it it maybe makes that that pool of everybody it, it's more competitive. It's harder to for everybody to be involved. We need right? to do, a, I mean, absolutely. We need to do a much better job communicating to the general public what the benefits are for those tags. Case in point, Montana. Montana had a tag 2013. Okay. This tag was auctioned off at the Wild Sheep Foundation's event down in Reno, their national convention. I was physically there. I watched. So that tag, we, okay, there is a, an administrative cost that the organization tag, you know, puts on to that tag once it's sold. It's a 5%. Somewhere between 5 and 10%, depending yeah. on the state. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And it's basically to administer, you know, the fees associated with marketing and, and so forth and, and making this tag available for auction. Okay. The Wild Sheep Foundation will take that 5%. Okay. Now, the rest of that money that goes 100% back into that Department of Fish and Game to manage that particular animal's, you know, management program. And, and part of that program is collaring. Part of that is trap and transplant. Part of that is disease management and all those things. And those yeah. things cost significant amount of money. Yeah. You know, you look at the numbers of, for example, the sheep in, you know, uh, in Wyoming. Yes. You look at the you look at the costs for us to manage that program, the the state of Wyoming to manage that program, versus potential revenue. If you were to just go off, okay, what's the the over the counter tag price times X number of tags you can actually sell? Hey, it does not pan out. No, it doesn't. I mean, interesting you brought that up. There was a I wanted to make a reference because I think we were talking about um, that back and forth via email. And from what I understand, now correct me if I'm wrong, so 20 elk tags over the counter in Wyoming would cost $1,000, correct? Yeah, you're going to be close. To, what's the, the, uh, the math is close, yeah. For, for residents. For residents, yeah. for residents yeah. correct. For yeah. residents tags. Close, close, yeah. Okay. 20 commissioner's licenses, 200,000 plus. Now look at the difference. That's significant. There is nothing wrong with what those tags are doing. Those tags are providing a funding mechanism to enhance that species program. Now, but there, at the same time, you have there, there's a balancing of interests. Right? Correct. Because I mean, you, you talk about there's nothing wrong with it. It raises two hundred thousand dollars versus a thousand dollars. Right. And so, by that logic, if you were to extrapolate that logic, you'd say, well, then that's just how we should sell licenses. Uh, to raise as much money for conservation as possible. Uh, but at, at some point, we have to remember... You still have residents and you still have people there in that state that want to be able to hunt those animals Yeah, we too. have to remember the whole reason why we... One of the main reasons we set up the North American model in the first place is we didn't want to be like England. Yeah. We, yeah. It, it, we didn't... And not to criticize any of our English friends out there, mm -hmm. but we didn't we didn't want to be <laughs> back to this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there might be one, <laughs> but we didn't want. I mean, we very intentionally set up a system that was different right. than what we had before we immigrated, before Europeans moved immigrated to the United States, right? Yeah, it's I mean, and it, so we have to be careful. It's a mix. It's a mix. We got to be careful not to slide slope. back into that. Right. And and I, how do we how do we balance that? That's a. I mean, that's probably a million dollar question. Th this is one of the great things. So here's you know here's the answer to the million dollar question. This is why the North America. This is why this is such a good model in the United States of America, and we should keep it because state by state. You have an opportunity for elected officials to get elected in that state 
you know, and, and to make those determinations That's correct. based on what the people who vote for them, that should be you if you're listening to the podcast. You should be out there talking to your elected officials and telling them what you think the priority should be and asking them to work to put, you know, smart people in the right places and to make the legislative changes necessary to make sure that we get the balance right. And and that's something that we shouldn't let go of, local control. The idea that you, the person on the ground in your area, you probably have pretty good knowledge about your local wildlife populations. So you should be talking to your Game and Fish Commission. Yeah, absolutely. You should be talking to your legislators and your governor and, and your representatives so that these things are done with your input. Yeah. Because we have a say here. Yeah. No, it's it's important. It's important for that state to be able to manage that themselves. How many how many states have you hunted in? That's a really good question. I don't know. I have to hmm. sit and think about that. Um we have all day. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I think... Safe to say quite a few. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's interesting. I think more and more, you know, people are getting more involved. They're, they're really working hard to educate themselves on the whole, the whole industry as a, you know, together. Um, when you think of like the local war movement, look at that. You know, they people thought it was a trend at first. Boy, they proved them wrong. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it, it is more of what we need. Just people getting reacquainted with, uh, with, uh, sorry, Dave's looking over my shoulder at how much time we've been on. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's people becoming reacquainted with something that we should never have gone away from in the first place. Is that, exactly. hey, we're all part of this system. Exactly. You know, if we look at the food chain, we're part of it. That's right. That's right. I was so I was actually going to try and I, I really wanted to talk predators with you, but uh, I think we're running out of time. Well, because we'll uh, that do it that'd again. be that'd turn out to be another thirty or forty minute discussion. It would. Uh, it so would. We'll, we'll have to save that one for another time. Absolutely. You guys are welcome back anytime. But before we go, mm-hmm. so we ask everybody this question. Okay. Uh, you're looking at me like, oh man, what, 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 is, what is, am I going to be asked here? What is this question? Oh, oh no. You uh, want me to give you my secret place to go hunt? I ask, I ask everybody these Maybe. two questions. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have asked several people for their secret first places. We need, first we need the Wi-Fi code. That's yeah. the first question we um, ask. Oh yeah, no, don't go no, there. No, <laughs> but, but, uh, so you're on the Your Mountain podcast. And one of the things that we do on this podcast, we, you know, we're talking about the, you know, the decisions that are affecting our, your land and your water and your wildlife. Mm-hmm. And it's, and we, we call it your mountain because it's, we're talking about your, everybody's, everybody listening, your, your mm-hmm. special places, your mountain, uh, our mountain. And we want to know what's your mountain. What's, what's that place that's most special to you without giving us the coordinates. coordinates. Yeah. Um, just what's your mountain? What's my mountain? Hmm. I would definitely, I would probably go back to my very, my first mountain, um, game experience, which was in Wyoming. And, um, it was the first time that I really saw wide open spaces and I, you know, was very blessed and very fortunate to have experienced, you know, hunting this incredibly beautiful animal and I don't know it just gave me it gave me a sense of inner peace that I know that I made a difference I you know made a difference in myself I made a difference in my family because I provided this now resource uh, for food and uh, yeah it was just it was kind of the full picture I'll get the coordinates from you later. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll share sounds, those with you. That sounds pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Kelly, thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Uh, you know, yeah. thanks for all you do. Thanks for all Cryptek does. Um, thanks for all you're doing for women and, and you know, being a motivator, you know, the providing mentorship uh, yeah. for, for new hunters, for young hunters. Um, really appreciate everything you're doing and look forward to continuing to follow 
your career and well, everything I, that you do. I appreciate you guys. You know, I just want to make a difference and want to make sure that the future has the same opportunities that we have. Amen to that. Thank Good you, goal. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Mike here from the Your Mountain Podcast. We need a favor. Go on our website, itsyourmountain.com, and find the links to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram so that you can like and follow us, and also so that you can share us with your friends. Wherever you got this podcast from, go ahead and click subscribe, rate us, and leave a comment. These simple things will really help us get the word out. That's itsyourmountain.com. Thanks for the help.